Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a weekly program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. This program is brought to you by Hope Fellowship, your community church located on the second floor of the St. Jacob's Outlet Mall. I'm Pastor Mike Zenker, and for the next half hour, I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will help you expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. So many are tired of trying harder to live the Christian life. I've got great news for you. You can stop trying. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Thank you for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace. It is a fantastic day to share some more good news with you. The feedback that has been coming in from individuals Finding and hearing about a freedom that was already theirs is fantastic. And thank you for taking time to send me an email or Facebook message. Uh, I love it. I love hearing that others are waking up to some really good news that has inspired me. And again, everything that you're hearing on this show, I have wrestled through with, I've struggled through with, I have uh, uh, studied. Uh, these truths have blown my mind, and it's such good news. More and more people need to hear about this. So if you are enjoying this, again, write in, let us know that you're listening, and uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. But also tell us where you're listening from, because I'm finding out that there are people watching on YouTube or listening to podcasts all across Canada, uh, through the United States, uh, in other parts of the world. I'm surprised pleasantly. So anyway, let's get back into this. Last, last time, we were talking about our complete forgiveness and how our Heavenly Father sees us, how the Trinity sees us and views us as humanity, and what happens with sin. How does God view sin? And you should know by now, God has put away sin and that He has absolutely forgiven us already. So uh, I want to do uh, just a couple more moments on that as we dig into some of the gifts that have been given to us by the Trinity. And you're going to love these. Um, by the way, this whole forgiveness topic, it's big. It's its so big. Uh, I want to teach through a series uh, following this one um, about forgiveness. What is it? Not just between our Heavenly Father and us, but how we work through it between you and and I, how we relationally can and need to forgive one another. But I have a big, big hunch that many individuals, especially in the Christian world, are having a hard time with forgiveness because of some serious misconceptions of what they think forgiveness is. I'm going to give you a sneak peek and tell you right on the front end, forgiveness is for your benefit, not the other person. Is there benefit potentially? Yes, there could be some residual effect, but forgiveness has to do between uh, you and your Heavenly Father, releasing the individual you're having a hard time with, and then you get to deal with it. That's just a quick sneak peek. And why then? Why do we need to forgive? Well, from Scripture, it says that we're able to forgive because we have been forgiven. Uh, let me remind you how Jesus viewed this whole idea of forgiveness. Uh, first of all, we forgive because we have been forgiven. That You'll see that in Scripture a little later. But after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, all teaching on, his, on forgiveness comes from a grace perspective. It speaks of our sins in the past, all taken care of. If you, for a moment, think you, think you are possessing and hanging on to this thing called sin, you need to wake up and look at the scripture, revisit what it says, and, uh, and believe what you're learning. Uh, it says in Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. This is again past tense. By now, you should be hearing a repetition of verses from many sources expressing the clear truth you have been forgiven. It's not something to beg for, it is something to thank God for. Uh, in Isaiah 43, you're going to love this. Uh, this is even in the Old Covenant. It says, I, even I, am the one who wipes 
out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. This is in the old covenant. It does not say God has amnesia and cannot, uh, can't, you know what I mean? He, it's totally gone, obliterated. He says he will not remember them, but remembering also has to, uh, uh, two ways to see the word remember. Uh, it does, if I were to take my hand and, and get it caught in a piece of machinery and it becomes uh, severed, it is now dismembered. Uh, what God says he will do is not remember it. He's not going to, he, whereas I go to the hospital, if the hand is preserved, they can reattach it, remember it to my body. And that is a, in a sense, uh, this Isaiah text is telling us God is not going to take our sin and remember it to us, reattach it to us. It is done, wiped out, put away. Hebrews 8 verse 12 says, For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. This is absolutely clear. Do you, do you struggle with this idea that God is remembering your sins? I did for years and years and years. I struggled with sins that I could remember. And if I can, clearly God must do the same thing because I put him on par with how I function. I had created God in my own image that he would treat me the way I treat myself or others. And that's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures clearly say he'll be merciful towards their iniquities. He'll remember their sins no more. In Hebrews 10, 17, it says again, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Well, there's something very different here. If this is how God sees our sins, how come we in our culture, in humanity, are so obsessed, especially in the Christian world, why are we so obsessed with sin? Why are we remembering everyone else's sins and pointing them out when God isn't even doing that? God is not doing that for a second. Now, let's let's take a look at a very popular um, a verse that most of us would know, whether you do the church thing or not, whether you've been a believer for a short period of time or a very long time. Most of us will know this next ancient Greek text. It, it's usually read at weddings, occasionally at funerals, but mostly at weddings. It's the love is patient, love is kind text. Do you remember that one? Uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Remember, in this text where it says love is patient, love is kind, the Greek word here is agape. And agape is one of four different words used uh, that the word love is translated from. Uh, the Greeks had uh, storge, which is parental love. They had phileo, which is like a phileo fish. Just kidding. It's more of a friendship love. Uh, and then they had um, eros. The, we get the word erotic. But in English, we have love. Storge, love. Phileo, love. Eros, love. Agape, love. Wow. One word, love, in the English language for four different meanings uh, in the Greek. And in this particular text, in 1 Corinthians 13, the word is agape. And it is uh, literally the essence of God. This is who God is. God is love, but this also this word also implies others-centered, never self-taking, others giving, always flowing outward. And this is a beautiful picture of who God is. Remember, 1 Corinthians 13 is not the to-do list for married couples. It is the get-to. It is the reflection of the divine living in you uh, picture. That's what this is. And one of the lines in this 1 Corinthians 13, uh, if you've, you've heard it so many times, but this is, I'm peeling back a new layer to help you see it differently. It says, love keeps no record of wrongs, as in there is no file. This is is big. If this is who God is, and if this is how God sees us, can you just take a moment today to believe this fact, that God is not keeping a record of your wrongs? It will suddenly change how you perceive God, 
It will change your um, willingness level to want to go and hang out with God in times of intimacy and prayer and meditation. This is this is so big. So I, I wanted to make sure we highlighted those things. Um, but the idea that God views us and our sin, uh, first of all, he sees us as forgiven and he sees our sin as in he does not remember them anymore. He will not place them back onto us. But this Trinity, the God of our, uh, our fa- God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, Spirit, uh, have given us gifts, justice, mercy, grace, and life. These gifts are profound. And I want to kind of walk you through some of what these meanings are. Um, justice is a big one. Now, I need to clarify and define justice. I, it depends what culture you are speaking from. In our Western world, the word justice is usually uh, payback, um, when somebody gets what's deserved. And that's, that's one sense of justice. So when somebody does something wrong, they go to court, they get convicted, and they pay for, they receive what is deserved, and we call that justice. However, Hebrew justice is the exact opposite. It is not, you get what you paid for instead of, it's like payback. I think uh, a number of teachers that I've heard have used this term. Uh, Hebrew, the Hebrew mindset in the Jewish culture is justice is about putting back, restorative, not paying back, but restorative, put back. And therefore, there is a gift that God gives us, His justice of restoring a relationship to what it was. That's That's what restoration is. That's what reconciliation is of God putting into place a way to restore our relationships. Mercy is something that we get as a gift too. And mercy, in short, is really when we don't receive what we deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And an easy example of this is a ticket. So if I get pulled over by a police officer uh, and uh, I deserve a ticket for speeding and the officer is kind and says, you know what, today I'm going to give you a warning, you may go. I knew I should have gotten a ticket. I, I received mercy. I was fully guilty. I was guilty of what I did, but I received mercy. Then there's this gift of grace in comparison to this. Grace is a gift God gives us that we don't deserve. Our be, if, if we're living our mindsets, in our mindsets that uh, our uh, deserving comes from our behavior, well, there you go. Grace is definitely something we don't deserve. And yet, we receive grace. And that is beautiful. Uh, on top of that, there's another beautiful picture uh, that we're going to have to dive into. And that is, if he's giving us his grace, well, what is grace? Well, I, I'm going to suggest today that a, another understanding of grace is to recognize it is his life. <clears throat> he has given us his very life. The life of God has been given to us. I used to think that John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave, you know, he sent his son, blah, 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 to get, and then we'll get eternal life. I always thought that when I died, that's when I get that life. But I have good news. We have the life right now. It's not something we get later. It's something we have immediately right now. We already possess the life of God. And when we come back to the second half of today's program, uh, I will show you some verses that point out the life is in us and who is the source. I'll see you in just a few minutes. Martin Small Engines and Auto Clinic in Elmira is more than small engines. Like their name says, Martin's is also a full-service auto clinic focused on automotive repair and service, brakes, tires, local lockout service, and so much more. Whatever you need, Martin's can do it. For that small-town feel with large shop quality, trust a team that really cares. Martin Small Engines and Auto Clinic, Industrial Drive Elmira and martinselmira.com. Looking for adventure in the great outdoors? It's not far from your own backyard at Conestoga River Horseback Adventures. Fun for the whole family or why not your next corporate party? Trail rides are offered all year round and other options like pony rides and birthday parties for the young cowboys and cowgirls. Afterwards, you can relax and keep the party going in their large, comfortable lounge. Conestoga River Horseback Adventures, 519-888-6503 and horsebackadventures.ca. 
So the gifts that we have been talking about have been the justice of God to us, the mercy of God to us, the grace of God. And what is the grace? It is his life. And I want to remind us of some very powerful verses that re- that show and reveal that we already have and possess the life of Christ. In John 3.16, uh, and again, this is a picture of grace being the life of God. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In John 3.36, it says, he who believes in the son has eternal life, as in now Oh my goodness, Uh, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. That's John John 6.33. A big, big uh, word there is the word world and gives life to the world. Oh my goodness. And in John 6.40, it says, for this is the will of my father that Everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life. Oh, wow. And here's a a grandiose, wonderful one. John 10.10 says, I came that they may have life and may have it abundantly, as in in huge supply, not just a little sliver, not just enough to, you know, get you across the finishing line. This is about the abundance of God. The gift that God has given us. Mercy is the gift of forgiveness. Grace is the gift of his life. We need to keep these things in mind because otherwise we're going to feel a sense of condemnation. We're going to have a sense or feeling that God's going to be mad at us, that something's just not right. These are the lies that were entered into the garden in Eden, that they were not quite like God and therefore they there was something they could do to become more God-like. That was the big lie in the garden. Well, here, if we're feeling we're not quite right with God, then there must be something we can do to get more right with God. Same lie. But instead, believe you are already loved, already forgiven, already right with God. There is nothing we can do which will cause God to condemn us. Yes, it is true. There's nothing you can do to make God or cause God to condemn you. Romans 8 1 says this There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Wow, zero condemnation. God never becomes angry with you. What would possibly make God angry with you? Well, I would say, and you would agree with me, sin, does sin make God angry? Well, guess what? God put away sin. He put away the source of what could have been angry. And again, even when we sin, he's not angry at us, if, if there's something that's going to harm you and I, it's the sin that harms his children that he's upset about, not you, his child. There's a big difference. You, okay, did you know you can't even disappoint God? Yes, you can't even disappoint him. What, what, what gall do I have? What audacity do I have to declare that God won't even be disappointed with you? Well, here's the thing. Here's something you need to know about God and what the word disappointment means. The word disappointment is the result of an, uh, um, a result of a, uh, an unfulfilled expectation. Disappointment is the result of an unfulfilled expectation. And uh, I'll tell you this, God doesn't expect anything. He already knows. He knows what you're going to do. He knows what you have done. He's And even if you're setting, if, if for me, messed up decisions you're going to make, God has already provided a gracious path on the other side of your poor choices. He's still gracious in it all. You are in good hands. You need not fear that God's going to be disappointed with you. I've had people upset with me for saying, how can you say God's not disappointed with you? Because God doesn't have a false expectation on us. He's not having an expectation of, oh my goodness, I can't believe you did that. You're never going to hear God say, I expected more from you. Yes, after all I did for you, yep, how could you do that? You won't hear that word from God's mouth. 
or from his spirit. He's not going to say, what? You surprised me with that behavior. Uh, you know what? I, I got to tell you this next line. It, it never occurred to me that uh, you would do that. God doesn't do that. God would never say that. Oh, I, I never saw that coming. Do you realize nothing ever occurs to God? It didn't occur to me you'd do that. You can't throw God off. You can't hear God say, oh my goodness, I did not plan for that. Oh, I did not see that coming. Folks, your Heavenly Father is not condemning you. He's not disappointed with you. He's for you. And when we do mess up, believe me, it does grieve the heart of God when we sin, but it doesn't surprise Him. When we sin, what do we do? We acknowledge it, but we don't do it for forgiveness. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, talking about confessing your sins one to another. Oh, wait, does it say one to another or to God? Oh, it says one to another. But anyway, the idea of confessing our sin, the word confess means to agree with. And I, I confess my sins to God. I confess and I agree with God. I uh, My prayer is, as we talked in the last program, I, my prayer is now directed to, instead of begging for what I already have, instead I confess to say, Father, what I just did was inconsistent with who I am. But I also confess I am forgiven. Thank you for your mercy. Oh, thank you, Father. And it just leads into another act of worship and does behavioral changes too. Repentance comes along with that. It's a changing of our mind, turning the other way. Stop doing what is inconsistent with your new nature and start uh, letting the Spirit of Christ flow out of you. In John 16, 8, I'd like to challenge all of you to go read that in multiple translations. John 16, 8. You're going to hear that the Spirit of God convicts believers of righteousness and the world of unbelief. Not sin. Not sin. Sin has been taken care of. Sin has been put away. So how would God convict people of sin? It's not sin that's being convicted. It may feel like it, but it isn't. Instead, when I sin, the Holy Spirit convicts me. That's not who you are. You're righteous, pure, clean. Oh my goodness, I see that now. And then I, I'm turned back in my mind to truth. I'm repenting back to the original, to who I am. And that's, take a look at this. And even for the world, he doesn't convict the world of sin. He convicts the world of their unbelief. Go read yourself. Just uh, honestly, just read it through slowly, word by word. John 16, 8. And that's a whole section. Read around it, verses before and after. And you will quickly discover you're in good hands. Romans 8 from the New Living Translation. More on God's love towards us and how he sees us. It says, who dare accuse us? In verse 33, who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. There you go, folks. You already have a clear picture. No one's going to uh, accuse you. <laughs> you. You are already in right standing because God himself has given us right standing. Who will then condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. That's a lot of backup power there. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean we no longer he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Uh, as the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And here is the best part. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever, ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want to read to you from the Passion Translation, uh, Romans 8.38. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. 
I am convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There is no power above or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. Go read Romans 8, 8, 38 and 39. As a reminder, there is no condemnation for you. That's what starts off with Romans 8, 1. But here we are getting a beautiful picture. You are wrapped up in love. This is how God sees you and I. This is how God sees all of humanity as forgiven and loved. Mercy and grace and life has been given to us. Now believe it. Well, I hope today was encouraging for you. It sure was for me. I love rereading these verses and seeing it through a lens of hope. So come back and join us next week as we continue a hope-filled perspective on how God sees us and loves us. We'll see you then. Looking for a real estate agent that will put your needs before his? Terry Van Lent is just that agent. Caring and honest are just two of Terry's best qualities, and they shine through in his real estate career. As a longtime resident of Waterloo Region, Terry is well acquainted with the area and its multitude of attractive amenities. For an agent that cares, call Terry Van Lent at Coldwell Banker Peter Benninger Realty, 519-742-5800, extension 2060. Family run, family owned. So their focus is on you. Conestoga Lodge Retirement Residence is a full-service retirement home in Kitchener. And you'll be impressed to know that they are not a big corporate chain. They're quality-driven with a focus on each and every individual. Conestoga Lodge offers permanent and short-term stays. To book a free, no-obligation tour, you can call 519-576-2140 or visit online at conestogalodge.com. You've been listening to Still Growing in Grace. I'm Pastor Mike Zenker, and I'd like to invite you to join me next Tuesday morning at 1130 when our teaching time will continue. Or join us at 1030 every Sunday morning at Hope Fellowship, your community church located on the second floor of the St. Jacob's Outlet Mall. If this show has been an encouragement to you, won't you help us spread this good news? Make your donation today by visiting stillgrowingingrace.ca. You can also catch up on past programs, watch YouTube videos of our talks, and download our weekly podcasts. Sign up for our email list and send in your questions. After all, no one has arrived, and we are all still growing in grace.